Okay. So the agenda is just set the stage where we're headed. There's really three components. One is to talk briefly, just give a depression overview. I know depression is obviously in the media, on television, and so forth, and podcasts, and so forth, in the last number of months with COVID. Well, just kind of uh, set the record straight a little bit with where we're headed. But the main thrust of the presentation is the journey that I've been on for 45 years with, and uh, so forth. And then we'll talk briefly about my book. I'm not here to hurt itself by any means. That's not the, the reason for being here, but it does tie in explicitly into the journey. So those are really the, the three agenda topics. Just a side line. Normally, I like to kind of mingle with the audience, but because of COVID, I'm standing up here and uh, social or physical distancing is like fast, so that's acceptable. All right, so with that, Type of depression. Now, depression is used quite often in the news, in much same as cancerous, generically. Uh, just the word depression and it kind of assumes that that's uh, that the, what's out there. It's just the depression. But there's much more to that. There's various types of depression. They all have their um, intricacies and, and characteristics. We'll just go through them briefly. We won't spend a lot of time on this. One is bipolar depression. It used to be called manic depression, but that's where you have the wide swings from the high to the low, right? You have the very manic, so to speak, state of euphoria and to the low state of depression. So that's bipolar. Perinatal or post uh, uh, pardon depression is more surrounding the birth of a child, and that's fairly prevalent in, in our society. Premenstrual disorder is not new, but it's fairly given more problems fairly recently. And apparently that's uh, like an extreme case of premenstrual syndrome is what that's called. Uh, that's the best way of rendering the that's described. Psychotic depression, that's sometimes not listed as a type of depression because it's not really a depression itself. It's really when a psychotic episode accompanies the depression. So for example, Unfortunately, when you read the news, particularly in the United States, it seems when a parent um, kills their children, his or her children, because uh, they hear voices in their head or they have hallucinations and so forth, that's typically a case of psychotic depression. Seasonal effect, uh, affective disorder, SAD, appropriate acronym, is when you live in a northern country like we do in northern climate where they, the sunlight is a little deficient during the fall and winter months you get the kind of the blues and so forth. So those are five of the major types of depression before we get to the one, the two that I've been affected by. And just to qualify this, depending on your source of information will dictate how many types of depression there is. And my source is from the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the most noted research and academic with uh, hospitals in the United States. So it's pretty credible information. So persistent depressive disorder is one of the types of depression I've dealt with for over 45 years. Probably not familiar with the name, uh, the title. They've given them different titles over the years, but this is one we'll expand on in a few minutes, so just bear with me. And that's why it's a bold because I, I've dealt with it. But I've also dealt with major depressive disorder. Uh, and we'll expand on this in a, in a little, bit, little bit as well. So just bear with me with that. But uh, these are the two types I, I've dealt with. Causes of depression. So this is kind of interesting because unlike most or many types of physical ailments, which the medical profession has a pretty good handle on the causes. Depression, they really, they, being the, the medical uh, experts and doctors, so forth, don't really have a definitive cause of depression yet. There's no kind of statement or quantitative or um, research that's concluded as the specific cause of depression. That's kind of interesting. They haven't reached that extent yet. But there are a couple of uh, kind of hypotheses, I guess, or what research has indicated some of the causes. One is chemistry, which makes kind of sense. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a PhD, I'm not a medical doctor. 
but chemistry certainly makes sense. There's something like 85 or 86 billion neurons in your brain. It seems to make intuitive or logical or practical sense that some of those can go skewed sometime during your life. Most notably during puberty when all the chemical and hormonal changes take place. So that's, uh, I've never had a doctor pinpoint or suggest that chemistry applies to me, but I suspect it does. Environment's another cause of depression that they, the research believe to be the case, and it applies to me. And the environment is, is kind of interesting because it's, it's kind of a bit of like an elephant in the room kind of topic. People don't really want to talk about the environment. Mostly because it deals with the family, right? Uh, in my case, and with most people, uh, as this pertains to, you're affected greatly by your parental guidance, right? Your guidance by your uh, parents are growing up. And in my case, I, I think uh, living in a household that was frankly devoid of love or, or caring, or I guess in my terminology, Emotionally indifference is really the term I use. That's not sure if that's a medical term or not, but I think environment had a lot to do with how I turned out, so to speak. Genetics is one that they do suspect that is the cause for depression, and, and in my case as well. And that makes sense because most physical illnesses are traced back to genetics. As an example, uh, Cheryl has a son who has colitis. And it kind of makes sense because his father has claims. So the genes have been passed down from generation to generation. So it seems to make sense that genetics would play a role. I, my parents, or my father, who was since deceased, but he was uh, very negative and very pessimistic, so forth. I'm sure if he had, if he had gone to the doctor, he wouldn't have diagnosed with depression like that. But unfortunately, he didn't believe in doctors and so forth. And I have two brothers that are similar. They'd be very depressed if they wouldn't see a doctor, but they chose not to. So these are three, the combination of three that are the big cause of depression and, and apply to me as well. Now, I've never had a doctor suggest this is my kind of hypothesis, so to speak, but it's firm to believe that to be the case. Uh, what, whether or not I'll ever find out the true cause of this probably a moot point at this point. Other causes of depression, they're not molded because they simply don't apply to me. Life events can trigger depression, especially, uh, especially if you have the propensity to be inclined to depress, to be depressed. So for example, if you have a death of a loved one, uh, divorce is another trigger for depression too. So. Medical conditions, apparently if you have a term of illness, for example, and you're told you only have so long to live, that will trigger depression. Which kind of makes sense. Medication, apparently some medications that are used to treat medical conditions can also trigger depression. And other factors, a host of other ones, most notably legal drugs, can trigger depression. Those are some of the causes. Like I say, if you know, cast and prove that those are indeed the, the, the facts, but that's, that's what the doctors have, have uh, dealt with so far. Some depression statistics, just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. With depression, 208 million people worldwide. It's not isolated to North America or to Western society. It's, it's all different cultures throughout the world. 1.6 times more prevalent in women than in men. And the statistics, I believe this is from actually Statistics Canada, I think, uh, or call my source here, but um, it can be, I've seen it from 1.5 times to three times as much for women as men. You know, the number is different, but the main message is that it's certainly more prevalent in women than men. And it's interesting because there's two components to that. One is, um, that certainly seems to be the case because women are subject to more hormonal changes in their body that can be, you know, to chemistry that can trigger the depression. So, uh, pregnancy, for example, 
uh, um, and so forth. Those types of events that take place during the your lifetime. Where men don't have that. But the other component is they don't really know how much contributor is to the fact that men have traditionally been typically been more likely to keep uh, internalize their depression, right? To not speak about it, to not talk about depression. So where women are more apt to open up about depression. But we also have not it's certainly more prevalent in women than men. 70% of mental health, mental health problems have their onset during uh, puberty or childhood or adolescence. That makes sense, again, with the, with the hormonal changes that take taken place during the puberty. And it probably explains why you see on television now quite often mental health commercials are geared to younger people, teenagers, so forth, because they realize that they get a handle on and stem with the issues of, from that period of your life. Your adults would be much better. 4,000 Canadians per year die by suicide. That's about 10 or 11 Canadians per day. The number is quite large. Uh, most of those, I suppose, three quarters of those are men, and the other quarters, women, approximately. Just one thing to note is it's uh, the terminology die by suicide. When we were growing up, it was you know it was typically referred to as committing suicide. I mean, that was the term we used. But now the medical health professionals are trying to steer away from that legacy um, of, of committed suicide to suggest that crime has been acted upon to something more uh, uh, not not a criminal act, but the, which would be denoted uh, by dying by suicide. So that's the, the new, new term. And of course, you can't have any discussion in this day and age the last couple of years unless COVID comes into the picture. The statistics vary, but the message is the number of depressed individuals has certainly increased, in this case, 70%. I think this is the data statistic, but certainly an increase since COVID was, uh, came into the scene. So that's a little backdrop to the to depression, just in, in really non-clinical, non-academic terms, which I, I like to relate to the audience that way. Um, as far as timelines about my journey, the second part of the agenda is this the persistent depressive disorder, the kind of multiple, traced back to 1975, was in grade 10 at that time, just at the stage of puberty, and uh, all those changes that take place then. But the depression wasn't diagnosed until 1995. So I had 20 years I dealt with depression without knowing what I, what I had. That seems inconceivable today, but in fairness, back in 1975, that was a long time ago, it was 47 years ago. You know, what did we know about depression? We didn't. It wasn't talked about. You know, the only thing I knew about depression was watching one flu of the cookies test with Jack Nicholson, right? I just knew I wasn't one of them, so to speak. And so I dismissed it. Unfortunately, I didn't have a relationship with my parents to open up and talk to them about it, so I kept it all inside. 1995, it was actually thanks to Cheryl. Cheryl came to me one day when I was a trickle and bummed out and said to me flat out, right? She said, Bruce, I think you suffer from depression. So she was the first one to actually, quote, diagnose it as per se as to what I was dealing with. And the reason she was familiar with depression, she, she suffered from postpartum depression herself when she had her ch children, her first child. So she was familiar with it. I didn't have postpartum depression, but I had depression. I went to see my family doctor, and he diagnosed it simply as depression. He didn't denote the label type of depression, but he did, uh, called it depression. Gave me a prescription of Prozac, and if you remember, Prozac was a wonder drug at the time, and uh, set me on my way. And that was kind of it. So I hoped, anyway. Wasn't to be. I'd stayed with my family doctor for a couple more years with new prescriptions, more prescriptions. But then it 
kind of ran out of his realm of expertise, so he, he referred me to the psychiatrist, which still I'm talking to today and work with today. He, he defined it as not depression, but persistent depressive disorder. In other words, he narrowed it down to the type of depression. But at the same time, during the diagnosis, he as a, as a depression diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, which we'll talk about in a minute as well, so it's fairly. And then in 2006, partly because of the uh, treatments I've tried up until that point in time, from 1997 to 2006, didn't work, let's get to in a minute too, is uh, I became pretty, you know, pretty swollen and fell into a major depressive disorder. Where is that going to make sense? Uh, Twelve time ones. So now to explain this persistent depressive disorder, what is it? Really, the naming convention doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. It used to be called the severe insomnia. Again, that term is not known to most people. But what it is is depressed mood for at least two years. So it's a chronic state of depression and dysfunction. But there's no joy in your life. It's pretty gray. It's pretty blah. It's pretty blah existence. Sad, low, or dark mood. And probably the, the best example that people can relate to is like an E or the Winnie the Pooh character. Right? It's pretty. That's a pretty striking example. You know, uh, uh, E or you know, walks around his head, his arms, shoulders slumped over. He's always pessimistic. He's kind of got the rain cloud over his head. That's a something with persistent depressive disorder. Other signs there that you can read yourself. Go to an idea that I had all the ones that are listed there except hopelessness. For some reason, I don't know why, I still had hope even, even during the depression. I thought something, my ship had come in, I would get better, I would just find myself, I would just achieve another goal and so forth. The major depressive disorder, which is what I had in 2006, um, kind of unlike the persistent uh, disorder, this one is, is more, can be shorter term, uh, but more severe. So as the name uh, suggests here, every day for at least two weeks. And some of the symptoms and characteristics are depressed mood and the big ones diminished interest. The reason there's asterisks there is because they have to be prevalent in order to be um, considered to be this disorder. And some of the other ones there, psychometric agitation, just to explain that, is maybe somebody brings their hands or fidgets or maybe takes some fingernails or whatever. And the big one is suicidal thoughts. That's, that's a big showstopper there. I mentioned earlier when the generalized anxiety disorder was diagnosed with, and I had all these characteristics. Um, in fact, Cheryl and I talked this one time and, and never had a correlation between the disorder and depression, but somehow, somehow we wondered the, the anxiety created depression. That I feel like we don't know, but we just injection. But one thing is uh, anxiety is it's a theme between the twin sister depression. Why? Because quite often they use the same sounds. It's somebody suffering from anxiety and depression. And I was one of those people and one of those people. So we'll get to the treatments and go to them really quickly. First of all, I'm praying to so to speak, I was trying to figure out how to type these. But my family doctor, when he first diagnosed me with symptoms of generic depression, he sent me on a number of treatment uh, options to dismiss or to uh, eliminate physical challenges of me causing or limiting the depression, such as sleep disorder, clinic, as well as having so much trouble sleeping. Allergy test, which kind of surprised me, but apparently some allergies to foods or whatever, or whatever can make or cause or kind of uh, 
kind of duplicate the pressure. And I was tested for some like 20 different allergies, but that didn't work. Came back negative. Thyroid test is fairly standard test because apparently a malfunction of thyroid will also uh, or contribute to depression. But all of those three types of tests came back negative. So we moved on. This was more so like the psychiatrist, Dr. Chandra Seaman's name is. He targeted more of depression and anxiety, including 20 or more of medication. I sort of lost track now. Some taken in isolation, some taken augmenting others, and so forth. Um, but really, I think they won, which we'll talk about near the end of the presentation. They, uh, they were ineffective. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a standard treatment for depression along with medications, typically in conjunction with medications. And so my doctor was sent me to the therapist, actually two separate occasions. Cognitive behavioral therapy kind of makes sense. I understand the logic behind it. It's where you, you may have distorted views or thoughts of the world around you. Perhaps because of your environment while growing up, you were skewed by the influence of others and that kind of rich truth. Unfortunately, common behavioral therapy work I understood from a rational perspective. Kind of didn't feel like Spock on the Star Trek. You know, I understood it logically, rationally, but not emotionally. Didn't, couldn't bridge that gap. So that rule that I've had to prove TMS, which probably most people have never heard of, I'll just explain it briefly. My doctor sent me to a private clinic in Toronto, in essence what they do is your, the technician puts a metal plate on your head, you're, you're awake during this, you're not put under with anesthesia or anything. And the, the machine, when you turn on the machine, it pulses, magnetic impulses into your brain to where the depression resides. Supposedly so I did that for two weeks for an hour a day. And at the end of two weeks, I thought, I think it really did help, but of course it didn't last. So that was obviously a challenge. The plus it was on the pop to expense of both of didn't pay for it, and my uh, insurance at work didn't pay for it. So it was totally in the pocket. So that's really the end of that option. And then we get to the red, so to speak, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, and it has a bad reputation, but apparently it's one of the most recognized and, and recommended options for depression treatment around the world. So I tried that. Uh, I was supposed to have an 18 day strain of treatment for about a day, and they do put you under unlike the previous treatment. And then the object wires up in your head, forehead, and the sending magnetic impulses that actually elect, uh, electrical impulse in your head, into your brain, creates a seizure, minor seizure, and I don't profess the physics of it or chemistry of it, well, but it's supposed to resolve the depression. Anyway, my doctor stopped the treatment after a week or so because it wasn't having any effect. So that would not make that treatment. Tried it. Ketamine is kind of a more recent option I tried. And ketamine, for those of you who may remember, was actually hit in the 60s, it's been around for a long time, and most recently it's been used as a date rate term. But when used medically, it, it's been shown to be very effective for depression. In fact, it was on a couple of time magazine a couple of years ago as one of the most common treatments for depression since Prozac. The problem is they don't, they can't get to last, the, the effects last. And uh, in my case, I don't know if it really worked at all. I don't think it did. I went for three or four treatments, took about an hour to administer by IV, and that was the end of it, but it didn't really have any effect on me. But by far the biggest treatment, professional treatment I try is deep brain stimulation. Now most, you know, everybody's aware of a pacemaker from the heart, right, that's been around for a years. 
Those are the pacemaker for the brain. And one of the balls went to the Colorado Western Hospital, and the surgeon there literally drove two holes in my brain, uh, in my skull, inserted two electrodes in my in the brain, and the depression in my eyes. Hopefully, the electrodes up underneath my skin with the wires and implanted the battery in my chest. So, I was deep brain stimulation. You may be aware that this is approved for Parkinson's disease to reduce the tremors. Apparently, it's very effective for that. So, a lot of researchers are trying to branch out to see if it'll work for depression. So it's a longer run of process, not the surgery itself, the surgery is about four, five hours or something like that. But between the time I applied to have the treatment, uh, the research done, to the time the actual procedure, it was about three years or something, with holdouts for funding, government bureaucracy, uh, getting a doctor someplace, and so forth. Dr. Ahmed was a, was a specialist, was a surgeon, very renowned surgeon. He was uh, on 60 minutes actually interviewed around the same time when I was at the procedure done. So they were kind of reinforced when I put in the right guy, so to speak. This is an example or a picture of the deep brain stimulation process. Quite a large, I'm not sure how to turn the crown or whatever, not for your head, keep it straight so your head doesn't move while putting in the electrodes. And, uh, but it's interesting to wait during this whole process, which really threw me off. Kind of remind me of the kind of electric scene and size, the size of the rounds are good. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. But anyway, the end result is that I thought it worked at first, but I don't believe it did now in retrospect. The only remnants I have of it, I saw the two bumps on my head where they did surgery, and plus the scar where they cut open my scalp. And that's it. The doctors who were involved in the surgery have moved on. So I saw the the uh, the uh, paper in my chest, but it'll stay with me till the day I die, apparently. Which I thought was a big deal because I think if you have hip surgery, you, you have the metal parts in your hip until they die too. So. But when all of a sudden, done, my psychiatrist in town told me flat out right one day, not long ago, said, Bruce, you're the most treatment resistant patient I've ever had. So I had no idea whether I'd take that event longer or what I didn't have to do with that. He said <laughs> Now, one thing I just want to take a minute to explain is that even though the professional measures were particularly effective, I didn't just rely on the medical field to help me get better. I took a number of self help measures myself and spoke to them briefly. Even before I was diagnosed as depression, so back as early as grade 10, when I just knew something was wrong, I didn't know what it was. And you know, sometime after that, I remember it was 20 years to 1995. Um, I took things by myself to try to, to, to better myself, to improve myself. The major thing I did was move problems, not just once, not twice, but three times. So that's interesting. In, in grade 12, I took in grade 12, and how I to dark with action. I finished high school, totally lost. So I decided, you know, to find a flight response. I chose flight. I moved to Edmonton to try to find myself. I hope I should have been there. So I moved over there and had an absolute disaster here and came back. Went to university, got to university, but that was a struggle. After university, I was still very much displaced. Moved up again, second time. Then came back, still totally lost. And then got myself a little bit together, started working as a career in the credit system. 
But, but then in 1987, I was still kind of a miss the way I felt. Still didn't have anybody to talk to. And I, that's when I decided to go to Chatham. Now, at the time when I moved to Chatham, I did it under the pretense that it was for economic opportunities, as, as a lot of people, as, you know, many, so many Easterners have done over the years. But that was just a cover for the fact that I was trying to find myself. But then when I moved to Chatham, I made up my mind that I'm not going to choose funding on the floor. So I stayed in China for 34 years, so and I fulfilled that, I guess. Then after the diagnosis in 1995, I set out on a mission to try to improve myself along with the professional measures. First thing I did was read Saul Paul books, a lot of them on the market. At that time, closed bookstores, big bookstores, and before online books came into being. But it was a little disheartening because you'd read some of books, and some of them were, uh, you know, seven ways to eat the blues kind of thing. Yeah, uh, that title of one of books. But they're uh, kind of, I wouldn't say superficial, but I, I remember thinking, you know, step one, you know, call a friend, you know, or whatever. I don't think, or step two, you know, walk 10 minutes around the block, get exercise. But I remember thinking, you know, if that solves your problem, then you don't have to watch it. I remember thinking that. In fact, I haven't read a self-help book in like 20 years now, it's been 12. Homeopathic doctor, uh, not really a self-help measure, I guess, but there's a self-help measure outside of the Western medicine, so to speak. And I visited the homeopathic doctor, actually, in Barry, his friend. Still owns the wrong center there today. So I went to the homeopathic uh, doctor. She, you know, did all the, the research and the questionnaires and so forth. And concocted some kind of mixture of what it was, which I took under my time you know, from day, every day for a week straight kind of thing. But anyway, I didn't do anything, so that's kind of good for that. Continuing education will expand on this in a minute. Uh, I found that education was helped me feel better with my self esteem and my confidence and so forth. We'll get things involved in that in a sec. Exercise in the extreme. It's no mystery that exercise is both self depression. So I took that but to the extreme. We'll expand on that in a sec. Then writing the middle parts. So that was an interesting one. What started off as, as an option, as therapy, a therapeutic response to the depression, uh, actually ended up in the combination in my book that's uh, available now. So, what the memoirs? It's called Breaking Free Depression's Drip, Drip. And the chronicle is a journey I've had. And the journey is probably the appropriate term of living with depression and anxiety. For now, it's for seven years. So, details and professional and self help measures that we just talked about. But probably most important to share is what I learned, what I didn't learn, how I opened up. Interpersonal issues are many, and the role of friends and family play. So, it's a sort of a sharing of the story. The audience for the book is anybody with depression. We talked earlier, one of the earlier slides, Twitter being the only people worldwide who suffer from depression. But when you have depression, it's one of the only experiences you can have. You feel like as if you're the only person that has the, the, the illness. And that's not the case. So this would help somebody who's been there. Now, if somebody with depression, it's very difficult to understand what someone's going through when they have depression. Uh, my boss from where I used to work, uh, when I opened up to him, it was a very difficult conversation because he simply couldn't understand that his life was all pretty strong and pretty robust and, and uh, no regrets kind of thing. So he just couldn't get, get this concept of depression. Hopefully, this book would help you understand what it's all about. Or just anybody 
who wants to know about depression. It's pretty difficult when you read in the, in the media about mental health issues. There's quite a number of advertisements now for mental health, but they don't really divulge what the issues are or what the, what the feeling was like. So this book should help. There is a message to the book. It's not kind of bog you on the head. It does not like a big chat or highlight, but it's it's really a word of hope in that you can achieve pretty good things despite what you do. So what are some of those things? And this is my kind of dog pony slide here. But so despite depression, some of the things that I don't think I've accomplished. I obtained my CPA designation a number of years ago. And because I work in the financial sector, I obtained my certified financial planner designation. All of us were required for the job at the time. And also, just recently, well, a few years ago now, I obtained my MBA, which is kind of interesting because I didn't need it for my career. I had to kind of in my career, so it wasn't a career, it was more of a movie to help me feel better, self-esteem, confidence, and so forth. I, well, I, uh, I found that achieving while well, doing well in school would help me feel better. So but in that sense, it helped. I talked about their uh, exercising, and I carried it to the stream. After he served five, it was actually close to 40. I started praying more as a new resolution, actually, and then I completed the next year or two five marathons, including the New York City Marathon and the Chicago Marathons. And that wasn't enough. I thought I'd do something else. You know, I leave time out to help me feel better. After age 40, I thought triathlon. In fact, I was really. At age 42, I participated in and finished half Ironman triathlon. And if you're not familiar with triathlon, that involved a two kilometer swim, 90 kilometer bike ride, and a 20 or half marathon uh, run. So it took me six and a half hours, but I did it. Um, but then I realized something was kind of appropriate. Metaphor, or whatever you call it, analogy, but the finish line kept on moving back. There were accounts of schools, education, marathons, so forth, triathlons. You know, I thought I'd be satisfied, but it wasn't. So I, I gave up triathlon. I haven't ripped my butt since, I don't think. But. Yes. <laughs> triathlon in the Bronx is all 50 states. And that was kind of the goal of the mission I was on. I accomplished a couple years ago. This is a really good accomplishment, but I, I mustered the energy and you know, effort to see the numbers, uh, noteworthy individuals in person, Pope John Paul, Princess Diana, and so forth. Um, lecture at Fanshawe College, I still remember that. That's in Fanshawe, that's in London, uh, while I'm in school. And I retired from the credit system as senior vice president of finances. It was a billion dollar. Credit union, I retired two years ago. So I like to think that I've accomplished quite a bit despite the depression, but at least to kind of a question of hunger. Not as would I achieve these feats if I, if I didn't have depression. Because a lot of these goals I had were to help me feel better. So if I felt better, when I bothered, you know, doing the trail going to be the high level of education and so forth. And the answer is probably not. I probably would have been content with my life and just been satisfied. That would have been the end of it. So for now, I'm kind of an extension of the question of honor, and that is, should I, uh, is there a benefit to depression? And you know, when you think that, it's kind of sad to think that it's kind of there is because I you know, the accomplish these Things I'm kind of proud of if I didn't have the depression. I'm an odd way to look at them. It's real. However, we're, we're 
heading towards the end of the presentation. So one thing is I have a number of TV and uh, radio podcast kind of podcast interviews. This book was released in, in just a couple of months ago in January. And almost we have such a couple of questions that the interview were asked include uh, oh no, sorry. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. How do so you about 45 years for I guess 47 actually? You know, that's how you did how you did what you've been through in terms of how are you today? Good question. And it's interesting because about a year ago, almost a year ago this month, Dr. Jim Sleeman switched me to himself. I, I I don't recall what he suggested. Uh, resulting is it's not a new medication, but it's fairly recent. It's not an antidepressant, it's actually an antipsychotic, but it does have a use for major depression as well. So he switched me to that. I did, you know, I switched kind of just as a, you know, whatever. Um, but lo and behold, after a couple of weeks, the mental challenges I've been dealing with for so long. Reside, um, received it. Um, so the amount of it, but use of resulting is actually what you've done. You think that if you live in the Netherlands, you're below sea level, but the, the dark soil is not in that condition where you receive back. As long as that's the case, you're okay with the farm or you can live there or whatever. So I feel like resulting is doing the same thing. I know the depression is there, it's holding it back. As long as it results in the result, Okay. But one thing is the physical symptoms still remain. So you know, physical or mental uh, resided. Uh, the physical still remain. Mental appetite, sleep issues, fatigue. And now I think things for anxiety. There's new physical issues, including the hemorrhoids, which is a trademark of the upper tonsil enforcement. And probably more so for me as an author. In fact, uh, I tried, I'm sure I might just move to the beaver in August. So I'm trying to continue running uh, to keep in shape. And I simply can't do it after three kilometers or something. I get very sick. So it's just a, but the end result is it's a trade off I have to make. My mental health versus my physical health. And I made some conscious decisions on whether or my mental health even if it's that expensive, right? Just well. Kind of not the trade off of it, but shows the extreme of uh, depression. Another question that the interviewers have asked me fairly typically is what got me through the, the, the 45 years, especially the tough times. One is the ethics and integrity. Feel you know, as if I have pretty strong ethics of integrity. I'm not sure where that stems from, but I've, I've kind of relied on that as some comfort in much the same way as people with religion or fall back on religion at times get tough. So I kind of do the same thing with ethics and integrity. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the idols. He had a quote the time is always right to do what's right. I like to think I hear that, so that provides me some level of comfort. Friends got me through, but not friends in the traditional sense. If you think of friends, it wasn't like I was a Mr. Popularity or Mr. Social Butterfly growing up. It was friends as in kind of abstract logic. When they had a little confidence on self esteem and self place, I wonder who it was. So it helped me reinforce or to provide some level of comfort. I looked at the friends and I thought, they're good people, they like me. So that my association logic, I must be okay. So that's kind of an odd way to look at it, but it's true. Now, if you're remiss about thanking uh, Cheryl and her family for getting me through, I should just compound or expand on this. It wasn't as if she her family, her brothers, sisters, uh, her kids, uh, and so forth. But 
Cheryl didn't call the ladies, she didn't pity the ladies, she didn't wake you up to your victim. Um, she was there as a pillar of strength and it showed me, proved me that something I, I had to live up to. So that helped me get through. And I have to show these pictures, pictures of our daughter Hannah, uh, taking her right down here in the dorm area. What it doesn't show is she's taken in December. What it doesn't show is like morning was 10 that day. So we come out of the gym and I come up to smile. <laughs> smile and many of us keep the picture out. Another one of the things that we have is recommendations. This one's kind of a tough one because these aren't show songs, by any means, but they're worth uh, talking about. One of them is if you think you have depression or anxiety or some other mental health that you accept the fact. When Cheryl first confided me that she thought I had depression, there was actually some relief. I felt like a um, prisoner who's been in the world for so long, and there's some almost relieved from his couch and other kids that are there. Uh, I felt the same way. Uh, just felt so relieved. So I think you can feel the same way if you suffer from depression and your doctor tells you that that's the first you can then move on to the recovery phase. Learn about the wellness. There's no excuse in this day and age for technology not to know what you're dealing with. I grew up with depression, just like interesting uh, acting as part of this presentation preparation. And there's four billion websites devoted to depression. Not billion, but billion. So it's out there, you can get the information. Keep up the hope. I say that fully understanding that hopelessness is a trademark of depression. But you have to keep up the hope. You have to be able to get out of bed, force yourself to get out of bed, if not for your own sake, for your family's sake. Also, be proactive. Our healthcare system is absolutely overwhelmed with COVID, especially since COVID. But so if you don't keep up on your doctor's butt, um, he or she will. will you know, Kick you off the terminal, and that's up to you, but you have to take responsibility for your own course of action. There were a number of times when Dr. Chen had seen it, and I'm sure I was going to close my heart. I just thought I was fine, and I wasn't. I kept on with it, and uh, thank you, thank you. So you have to do the same thing. Last thing, the last slide I have is. Depression has obviously gotten some uh, press recently. In fact, it's kind of, I find it a little bit overkill. But some noteworthy people who've done well in their lives who have had depression. Some historical, some contemporary. Uh, you can read the list yourself. Winston Churchill, noteworthy. He called the depression the black dog. Um, Ron Williams, the sad case there, actually one of the funniest people in this world, died by depression, or uh, suicide. Oprah Winfrey, one of the most influential women in the world, has had her issues. Brad Pitt, I mean, what guy would want to He said his own issues. Uh, J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, I've sold 500 million copies. I think her depression is before she made it big, but still. The point is that depression can affect anyone, their racial issue, gender, whatever. And a sad or true, I don't, I don't know if I want to put this next slide, I think it's the last one. Hopefully, oh, that's it, folks. Um, I don't know if you have any questions or any journal on the around, but I'm going to guess. And I understand that a lot of people use that self medicate to help people stay pain or when they get smaller than this, or when they get bigger. All right, good question. Good question. Um, question for those people in the zoo is not moving, but just make sure I understand. Alcohol is quite often associated with depression, but they don't come back on 
conversation you have about your own. Does that kind of recap it? Yeah, great question. Uh, alcohol, I was doing an alcohol, you know, as far as I find out, this is alcohol, but I, I struggle with alcohol in the hands of self medication. No question. The problem is with alcohol, uh, especially in university, is, is a big challenge. Uh, it's kind of an odd analogy, but you think of the price is right in the game show, there's a way that the games and play in the centimeters or some sort uh, mountain climber or something, where you can get the price of a car or something, and the, you know, when you get along, the guy goes up the mountain, and if you, if you don't get the right, it falls off. Using that analogy, I would drink when I was out on a Saturday night or whatever. Uh, as a way of self medicating, the way and feeling just isolated myself in the world. Uh, but you know, but I wouldn't know when to stop. And then I get to the clinic and it's all off the next morning when I got what we have. But if there's a very really good question, um, one of the friends uh, mentioned the book died by suicide and he had challenged the call way worse than I had. And you know I, I so far, believe your alcohol wasn't the source of his problem. It's just what fueled uh, the frustrations to, to, to the surface. So, but I think long winded answer to your question. But does that kind of make sense? Yes, yeah, anybody else? No? I think it's a long question about depression. Hmm. All right, I think that's it. Um, if you're interested in what the sermon itself might be, we have our books back here. We can put a sign in for you gladly uh, and uh, show a lot of you around. Uh, I've done a number of these presentations up till now, and it's amazing how many people come up and talk to me afterwards and say, you know, my brother has uh, depression or I have depression. It's just an incredible number. So it's real. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And I'm sure that it was an answer for everybody, or maybe not, but it's a suffering. Thank you. 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 He doesn't say so, but there's a lot of funny stuff in that book. Tickles, I <laughs>